During this uh, last hour, I want to talk or finish uh, talking about uh, Douglas Wilson's essay, The Great Logic Fraud, and then get into a discussion of logic itself, truth and propositions. Um, we ended last hour talking about uh, Mr. Wilson's uh, refusal simply to recognize the problem of motion rather than trying to solve it. But then in the next section of his essay, beginning on page 90, he says symbolic logic uh, is also inadequate for dealing with our messy world, what he calls the messy world. He says, uh, and I quote, the structural argument is always valid, everything else being equal, but in the messy world, everything else is rarely equal. The bare bones structure is untized and then is assumed to have authority over real world situations and arguments. That uh, seems to suggest that uh, real world situations and arguments uh, are not subject to the canons of logic. Um, he recognizes, again, of course, the fallacy of affirming or asserting the consequent, but again he shows uh, no understanding that that's a fallacy committed uh, by all scientific endeavor, uh, all scientific experimental verification depends on the fallacy of affirming or asserting the consequent, and all in fact, all of empirical endeavor, which he recommends, depends on the same fallacy. If I have food before me and I believe that if I eat the food, I will be nourished, so I eat the food and I am nourished, uh, I therefore conclude that the food nourished me. Same fallacy. Um, well, continuing, he attacks then the possibility of accurate translations. Um, when he says English cannot be translated into symbolic language. Uh, the problem here is uh, not simply that he thinks the present symbolism is inadequate. Uh, Gordon Clark in his book on logic uh, challenges Bertrand Russell's uh, notation for the English word all, says it does not capture the meaning of the English word all, but then Clark goes on to devise his own notation for the English word all a meaning, a notation that does capture the meaning. But Wilson does not do that. He simply denies that it's possible to do that because language is uh, what he calls so messy. Um, he says at one point, no translation, including translation into symbolic notation, can escape the cliche that every translation loses something uh, in translation. And he concludes at one point, that the world of actual language use is so messy and so complex that only God understands the English language. Well, if that is so, then we're all lost. If only God understands English, uh, then none of us is, is saved, none of us has any hope or any knowledge. Um, but Mr. Wilson, of course, presumes that we understand the English language when he writes the English words uh, for our reading. begins to talk about uh, grammar uh, and vocabulary. Uh, and he gives a, a curious illustration here. He says, I have no idea how many tenses English have has, but he's a uh, fluent speaker of English and uh, not, a, not fluent in Latin, but he realizes how many tenses Latin has. And he's confusing here knowledge and ability to perform something. Uh, many people can ride bikes without uh, being able to tell you how they do so. Many people do common tasks every day and have I, no idea what they're doing. Uh, they cannot explain it. Um, the confusion here is simply a confusion between knowledge and experience or knowledge and practice. Uh, Mexicans flunk Spanish courses. The Spanish may be their native language, uh, but they do not know Spanish. They can speak it, but they flunk their courses. Americans flunk English grammar courses. They speak English, um, but they do not know the language. Uh, they don't know how many tenses English has or the difference between an adjective and an adverb. He says at one point, to overstate my case a little, a man does not have mastery of a word until he is unable, and he uh, italicizes the unable, to tell you how he knows what it means. Well, this simply suggests that uh, this inability is mastery. He has mastery when he's unable to tell you. Uh, or this ignorance 
of how he, had, uh, how he uh, obtained his knowledge is somehow confused with mastery of the English language. Mr. Wilson is not opposed to all forms of precision. He certainly is opposed to intellectual precision. Um, but he does endorse on page 95 what he calls euphonic precision. Now, euphonic precision is aesthetics. Uh, that is, <clears throat> one's language, one's writing, one's speech uh, should be pleasing to the ear. Um, that is the sort of thing, of course, that uh, Paul disclaims in uh, 1 Corinthians. He's not talking, uh, he denies the value of euphonic precision as a way of understanding at all. He says what we need is some wisdom or some knowledge uh, from God. Now, Mr. Wilson at the bottom of page 95 talks about some what he calls quirks of the English language, which are indeed uh, good examples of some substandard English. Then he talks about the different pronunciations of the uh, O-U-G-H in different words, which of course is very interesting, but hardly to the point of saying that uh, we cannot understand things precisely. Um, he does admit that God gave Adam language. He says uh, Adam was created speaking. Uh, and of course, in addition to that original gift, God created more languages at Babel. But he seems to think that languages develop over time, and because they do, uh, somehow uh, they lose the uh, precision that perhaps uh, characterizes the original language. He, in the middle of 96, he goes on and says, the number eight means just one thing, for example, and does not on occasion mean more or less than that. But words have both denotations and connotations. Well, my comment is uh, eight is a word. Um, and one should realize that uh, mathematical equations uh, can be put into English prose very easily. Uh, the prose may not ha may lack that euphonic precision that Mr. Wilson desires, uh, but the prose can accurately state what the mathematical shorthand does. That's the value of the symbols. Uh, it is a shorthand way of expressing the English prose, and you can translate uh, the, Eng the uh, mathematical equations uh, into English prose. Bottom of page 96, he says, add eight to eight, and you know you will always get 16. This is quite true, but it does not get one very far. This contrasts and contradicts with what he said earlier on page 85, where he says, if you add 15 and 20, you get 35. He denied that 15 plus 20 uh, equals uh, 35. Then he gives an example, really, of what he's driving at in the whole essay. He says, he gives a quote from scripture, the eye of the Lord follows all those who fear him and underneath are the everlasting arms. He says, for one who has certain precisionist expectations, this is full of nonsense. How can an incorporeal spirit have eyes and arms? One person with no soul takes the theological abstractions necessary in their place and assumes that this is the whole truth of the matter. Another person with no soul doesn't understand poetry either and assumes that God must have eyes and arms. This is getting at what he means by poetry. It's figurative language. It's not necessarily verse or rhyme, but, but figurative language. And what he is attacking here in the form of what he calls theological abstractions is literal language. He says uh, theological abstractions are necessary in their place. Um, he doesn't inform us here what their place is. But obviously, he thinks their place is inferior to what he calls the understanding of poetry. And it's only those with no soul who don't understand poetry. Now, this mystical idea of soul, or this idea of soul as the uh, <clears throat> seat of poetry, harkens back to some earlier thinkers that we, or writers that we talked about, A.W. Tozer as one, and Wilhelm Niesel is another. Tozer spoke about the soul of truth. You have to get beyond the text to the soul of truth. And uh, Mr. Wilson seems to be suggesting something like that. The theological abstractions, that is, the literal language, it has a place, but it certainly uh, isn't as good as or as conducive to understanding as poetry is. Uh, Mr. Wilson obviously thinks he has soul um, 
and I guess he's offering us some soul food uh, in this essay. He next brings up the subject of conventions. He says you have, there are certain conventions of speech. The question is, is logic a convention? And he doesn't uh, inform us of that. He doesn't tell us what the right understanding of logic is. Bottom of page 97, he says, language is not algebra, words do not have decimal places. Uh, now, since I'm a man with no soul, um, I understand this to mean that words are not precise. Uh, perhaps in ordinary everyday language, uh, we do use words imprecisely, but that's no defense for continuing to do so, and it's certainly no defense for saying that that's all that is possible. When one constructs an argument, or when one writes a book, uh, one ought to use words precisely, uh, not imprecisely. Uh, then he begins a discussion on the following page, what he distinguishes between two types of authority, the authority of the things of Scripture and the authority of the words. Um, he says, now given this distinction, what is an accurate translation? Should it strive for mathematical accuracy? And by mathematical, uh, he means logical accuracy. And uh, he says, or is this hopeless? And he suggests that it should not strive for mathematical accuracy. He says we need what he calls incarnational translation, uh, whatever that might be. More seriously, he suggests that the authority of the words is an external and accidental authority that falls away in the process of any interpretation, however good. That means the authority of the words of Scripture uh, disappears in any effort at translation. And what he suggests, the illustration he uses, is morphing the blurring of one face into another you've all seen on television or in the movie, uh, morphing uh, from one word into another. Uh, that is, a blur is the goal uh, of translators, and what they should seek is euphonic precision uh, rather than logical precision. And then he ends the essay with four pages of an appeal to authority, and I'll conclude my comments on his essay at this point. The four authorities he appeals to are Dorothy Sayers, C.S. Lewis, Jacques Barzun, and H.L. Mencken, uh, none of whom can be regarded as an evangelical Christian or as a Christian at all. Now, Barzon is a very interesting writing. Indeed, they all are interesting writers. Um, but to appeal to these folks as authorities in this matter um, is a bit, uh, shows one's uh, awareness of authorities in matters of logic and epistemology uh, is somewhat lacking. Yes, sir. Um, do you think that Wilson is using this kind of as a humor item, kind of like he does to bend his agenda, or is this really just where he's coming from? No, he's dead serious. I don't think he's uh, got his tongue in cheek in this at all. He's, he suggests at the beginning of the essay that he's writing it uh, because he sees a tendency among some classical Christian schools to raise standards too high. He says, we've got to have higher standards than the public school. But uh, he concludes the essay by saying, uh, and I quote, raise the standard and lighten up. So it's sort of a mixed signal uh, that he's giving now, but he makes it very clear that uh, logical or intellectual precision is not something that the, the classical school movement should be concerned about. After all, the goal of all of that is poetry rather than literal language. Well, let's go on and talk about uh, words, the value of words, and sentences and propositions. Um, just uh, by way of review briefly, words are intelligible signs of ideas, whether the words are spoken or written. Words are to be distinguished from images and gestures whose significance can only be known by someone explaining them in words. Uh, sentences are forms and arrangements of words that express a complete thought. The Bible's filled with sentences, not just single words. There are four kinds of sentences. Uh, declarative, uh, God created the, the heavens and the earth, for example. There's a declarative sentence, an interrogative sentence. Uh, did God create the heavens and the earth? Or um, 
Has God said to you that you may not eat of any tree of the garden? There's an interrogative sentence. An exclamatory sentence such as, wow, with an exclamation point after it. And an imperative sentence, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, all of these sentences may convey some meaning. The meaning of the exclamatory sentences can be discerned only from the context, uh, and then it is frequently doubtful. Uh, but only declarative sentences uh, make an assertion, whether the, the declarative sentences are in Scripture or elsewhere. That is, only declarative sentences predicate something of something else. Only declarative sentences inform us of something. Therefore, because only declarative sentences make an assertion, only declarative sentences and propositions, that is, the meaning of declarative sentences, uh, can be true or false. Uh, truth or falsehood is a characteristic or quality only of declarative sentences and propositions. And I want to emphasize this point. Words, single words, all by themselves without context cannot be true or false. I was driving around the other day, came across the car with the word represent in its back window. It uh, didn't inform me of anything. The word by itself cannot be true or false. Perhaps some of you might know what that means when you see it on a car window, uh, but I certainly did not. Perhaps some of you know the context, but the word itself did not inform me of anything. Questions cannot be true or false because they don't assert or inform. Has God told you not to eat of the, truth, uh, the fruit of the tree of the garden? And um, that question does not inform uh, Eve or Adam of anything. Exclamations cannot be true or false. A single word, uh, there's nothing asserted, nothing affirmed. Uh, they cannot be true or false. Uh, commands cannot be true or false. The command, you shall not murder, uh, is neither true nor false. Now, you can turn the command into a declarative sentence, and this is exactly what God does in the Scripture, of course, uh, in, in Exodus 20, where he says, I am the Lord thy God who has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He identifies himself the, with declarative sentences. And the command, you shall not murder, becomes a proposition when you say, God said you shall not murder. And that is when it also receives its authority. Uh, any command, shut the door, sit down, has no authority unless you know uh, who the speaker is. Uh, and in this case, uh, the speaker is God, uh, the greatest authority. Uh, and those commands and questions in Scripture as well uh, can be put in, put in the form of propositions. The devil says, or the serpent says, uh, ask, has God said? That becomes a proposition. Well, what is a proposition? Let's clarify that uh, if we could. A proposition is the meaning of a declarative sentence. Here's uh, an example or three examples, of three declarative sentences. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Im Angfang shuf got Himmel und Erde. And three, the heavens and the earth were created by God in the beginning. Three different sentences, two of them in English, one of them in German, but there's only one proposition. That is, the meaning of these three sentences is the same. Im Angfang Shuf got Himmel und Erde. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth were created by God in the beginning. Three different ways of arranging the words, uh, one uh, proposition. <clears throat> now, some declarative sentence, sentences are more than one proposition, and it can get uh, difficult to translate them uh, into categorical form, what's called categorical form in logic. For example, uh, take the sentence, uh, all except employees may enter the contest. You've probably seen that on contest rules. All except employees of Pepsi-Cola or whoever uh, may enter the contest. That's actually two propositions in one sentence. Uh, the sentence means no employees may enter the contest and all non-employees may enter the contest. And unless you can translate those sentences into categorical form. You don't have to translate them into symbolic logic, uh, but it, unless you can translate them into categorical form, 
you probably don't understand what the sentences mean. Uh, the simplest unit of thought is the proposition. And the proposition has uh, three elements in it. The logical subject, that is the term about which something is said. The logical predicate, predicate the term that is said about the logical subject. And the copula, the verb connecting the subject and the predicate which is usually the present tense of the verb to be. The cat is black. The logical subject is cat. The logical predicate is black. And the copula is is. The present tense of the verb to be. That's the simplest unit of thought. Now, the number of words, obviously, does not equal the number of, of elements uh, in, in the proposition. Uh, for example, in the sentence we used earlier, God created the heavens and the earth, there are seven English words. Putting it into categorical form, God is creator of heavens and earth, with hyphens between creator of heavens and earth. You still have seven words, but in categorical form, you have two terms and the copula, three elements. There are only four categorical forms, and all the propositions uh, of language uh, can be uh, translated into one of these uh, categorical forms. The meanings of every declarative sentence can be expressed in one of these four forms. <clears throat> now, the Bible is written in words, but not just single words all by themselves. The Bible is written in propositions. We saw the other evening that the Greek logos almost never refers to a single word. It refers to a proposition. It refers to uh, an entire sermon. It can refer to uh, in the entire body of wisdom. That's why the word word in John 1.1 1, 1 is not the best translation. In the beginning was the word. Logos rarely, if ever, refers to a single word. It would be better to translate it in the beginning was the wisdom. And that way you could tie it back to Proverbs, for example. Or in the beginning was the reason. Or in the beginning was logic. Uh, but to translate it simply and suggest that it's a single word uh, can be uh, completely misleading. Now, there are also other mistakes that people make about uh, the idea of truth because they don't believe that truth is an attribute or a quality or a characteristic of propositions alone. We've already talked about a few of these errors. People think that words, single words, by themselves, without context, might be true or false, or questions or commands. But there's also some more uh, poetic or theological nonsense uh, floating around. Uh, Martin Buber, the uh, Jewish philosopher, wrote a book 50 years ago called I and Thou. That is, he distinguished between two kinds of truth, what he called it truth and thou truth. It truth, of course, is intellectual propositions, the sort of things we've been talking about. The cat is black. David is king of Israel. Uh, Jesus died on the cross. Those are it truths. Thou truths are personal truths. They're not propositional. They're personal. And Buber derived this uh, distinction from Kierkegaard, of course. Now, what the phrase personal truth means um, is, is very difficult to discover. Uh, about all that these men tell us is that it doesn't consist of information conveyed to the mind. The mind is something different from the person. And uh, you have encounters with persons, and those encounters are devoid of content, intellectual content. Uh, you might have some feeling or you might have some experience, uh, but you do not have the intellectual uh, content. But there's also another way that people use the word true or the word truth, <clears throat> and this is very common in ordinary English. We talk about uh, a true gentleman. He's a true gentleman. And if you look at a few passages in the Gospel of John, we'll see a few other uh, examples of uh, the word true being used as an adjective describing, for instance, in John 1, 9, the true light. The logos is the true light. And in John 4, 23, true worshipers. True worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. 
Uh, John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And, of course, we have the phrase, the true God, and various other phrases uh, like that uh, in Scripture. Does this mean that something besides a proposition can be true? And not at all. Not at all. Uh, these are shorthand ways of saying the proposition. For, exa for, for example, the phrase true gentleman means it is true that he is a gentleman. But to call him a true gentleman is a shorthand way of saying that. Uh, but literally translated, it means the proposition is true that he is a gentleman. True vine, the same explanation. In fact, it's the same or the similar explanation for all of these. Uh, true vine, it is true that the logos, the Jesus, uh, is the vine. It is true, to speak more literally, uh, that the logos gives life. The vine is the life-giving uh, part of the plant. We are the branches. He is the vine. He gives us life. We're dependent on him. All of those propositions are true. True worshipers. It is true that the worshipers are worshipers of God. It is true that the worshipers are worshipers of God. They're not worshipers of idols. They are not worshipers of false ideas. Um, they are worshipers of God, and that is true. Uh, the true light, it is true that the Logos is the light. It is true that the Logos is the light. One can think of examples in Scripture as well where the adjective false is used. Uh, false witnesses, false prophets, false lips, uh, false reports. Uh, the false reports is obvious. Uh, you know, the reports are propositional. Uh, if you give a report uh, and uh, the report contains falsehoods, it's described as a, f a false report. What about false lips? When the Bible speaks of false lips, is it referring to the big plastic lips that we wear at Halloween? Of course not. Uh, a fault, the false lips are lips that speak falsehoods. And the same for false witnesses and false prophets. <clears throat> Those are prophets or witnesses uh, that speak falsehood. You've probably seen uh, <clears throat> the ad on TV for faux pearls. Faux pearls. Um, some marketers have turned the French word for false uh, into a way of marketing uh, plastic or whatever they are, pearls. And uh, pr uh, presumably they think people are going to be happy buying false pearls, faux pearls. And what faux pearls are, or literally meant, it is false that they are pearls. <coughs> um, well, let's continue here with this, with the idea that uh, truth liberates us from error. This is a very important idea. This propositional truth, the only kind there is, uh, liberates us from error. Now, how does it do this? If you look at John 8, uh, 31, uh, you'll see uh, the, the claim that Jesus makes there. Please turn to uh, John 8, 31. And you'll see the claim that he makes. He says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, how does the truth make us free? Well, the truth obviously liberates us from error. Nothing else does. Uh, the catechism defines sin as any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Sin does not consist solely in deeds, but in thoughts and words. Sin arises in our minds. Sin uh, begins in the mind. And what regeneration does when the Holy Spirit causes us to believe the truth, he causes us to be liberated from the sin, the error uh, that we had uh, once believed. Now, only true traditions can do that. Um, <clears throat> emotions do not liberate from error. Error is intellectual and emotions cannot liberate from error. Only truths can liberate from error. Uh, religious and mystical experiences do not liberate from error. Uh, deeds do not and cannot liberate from error. 
encounters without content, encounters without information, cannot liberate uh, from error. And this is the case because these things are not intellectual. It is only what the philosophers and theologians despise as it truth. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15. It is only because of it truths uh, like that that we are liberated from error. It is only because of those truths that we are made free. Ye shall know the truth, Jesus says, and the truth shall make you free. Now, I want to emphasize the fact that the, the sin does arise in the heart. If you recall the temptation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, back in uh, Genesis 3, um, the devil comes to Eve and first asks a question. He doesn't uh, make an assertion. He simply asks a question, has God said? And he gets Eve talking. And Eve reports, perhaps misreports, but she reports uh, what the commandment is. And at that point only does the serpent say, you shall not die. He makes an assertion. And then he goes on and he suggests that God has withholding information from Adam and Eve. Because God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, you will be as God. Uh, God has not been entirely truthful with them, he says. Well, this raises doubts in the minds of Eve and Adam as well. And the account given in Genesis uh, shows very clearly that the sin arises in the mind because Eve abandons the word of God as the standard for making judgment and adopts the view uh, that she can rely on the evidence of the senses. She, treats, she sees that the fruit and the tree are pleasing to the eyes and desirable to make one wise. And she relies on the evidence of her senses. Well, pictures and images cannot be true either. Uh, it's not simply... Uh, uh, single words or questions or commands, but pictures and images. In fact, pictures and images uh, <clears throat> can only be about particulars, can't even rise to the idea of a uh, concept or a proposition, let alone convey information or knowledge. Uh, a picture or an image may be the picture of an individual man or a tree or a landscape, uh, but it cannot be uh, anything other than a particular. Now, modern art, so-called abstract art, is an attempt uh, to paint universals. And, of course, that, that cannot be done. Um, painting, uh, to pick on painting for the moment, cannot deal with the unseen. It can't deal with the remote. It can't deal with the universal. It cannot even deal with all of nature, nor can a photograph. You can photograph a particular, but you cannot photograph a universal. But to think, we have to think uh, in universals. Uh, pictures, we say, are worth a thousand words, uh, but it requires, in many cases, uh, a thousand words to explain a picture. Uh, Dr. Clark tells the, uh, a story about some visiting Japanese professors who came to Clovis Hall in uh, uni the uh, Butler University when Clark taught there, and there's this huge tapestry hanging on the wall. It's of uh, Christ and the miraculous draft of fishes, and the Japanese scholars, of course, not having any background in Christianity, did not know the story. They did not know the words. So they stared at this tapestry, and un unable to figure out uh, its meaning, uh, asked Dr. Clark what it meant, and he had to explain it to them in words. And that's the case with all pictures. And we overlook that because we know the meaning of many pictures, um, but we didn't get that meaning from the picture. We were told what the picture means, and we were told uh, in words. Um, the Ten Commandments forbid the making of images and pictures uh, of God, because to suggest that you can make an image or a picture of God uh, is to suggest that he can be captured 
uh, in uh, that form or in that medium, and he cannot be. Uh, scripture says, uh, in the beginning was the word, not in the beginning was the picture, uh, or in the beginning was the image. And the Bible has no pictures in it. If a picture were a thousand words, God could have saved us all a lot of trouble and simply given us several pages of pictures uh, in it. But he doesn't. He gives us propositions. He gives us words. Uh, furthermore, a picture is not an argument. Not only is it uh, not an idea or not a conception or a proposition, uh, but it's not an argument. Uh, sometimes pictures are treated as if they were arguments, uh, but that's not the case. Well, let's go on and uh, talk about uh, some arguments and uh, how to recognize arguments in Scripture. Uh, an argument is... Uh, consists of at least two propositions, sometimes more, sometimes three. Um, and there are certain words that you can uh, look for in Scripture or any other uh, written or spoken uh, language that suggests what the premises are and what the conclusions are. For instance, the uh, some in indicators of uh, premises, if you see a phrase such as the reasons are or this is true because or assuming However, for, nevertheless, inasmuch as, but, and, since, because, all of these words are uh, indicators of premises. There are also words that indicate conclusions, such as consequently, or accordingly, or therefore, or hence, or then, or uh, this being so, or this entails that, or thus. And if you uh, read uh, scripture, uh, you can see those indicator words, and then you can begin to pick out the actual argument that's there. You can isolate the premise. You can find the conclusion. And uh, I'd like to give you some examples of arguments in Scripture um, so that uh, you can get started on this or at least think about uh, the fact that Scripture not only gives us sentences but actually gives us arguments. Uh, in addition to sentences. Look at uh, John, I believe it's chapter 8, verse 47. John 8, 47. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. Now you can pick up immediately on some of those indicator words there. Because you are not of God. Now that's a reason, that's a premise. That's not the conclusion because you are not of God. That's the reason for the conclusion. The conclusion is indicated by the word therefore. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. And the first part uh, of the sentence, the first part there, is another reason. He who is of God hears God's words. In English or in logic, it doesn't matter whether you have the conclusion first or the premise first or a premise, then the conclusion and another premise. In this particular verse, it's premise, conclusion, premise. He who is of God hears God's words, therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. If you want to translate that into categorical form, that is using only the two elements plus the copula, uh, only those of God are hearers of God's words. You are not of God Therefore, you are not hearers of God's words. And you can notice what might be called the Calvinism uh, in this verse. It's better to recognize it simply as Christianity. After all, Calvin didn't live until 1,500 years after Christ. Uh, this, is, this is simply Christianity. Arminians misread this verse. Arminians tend to misread the verse they think it says, you are not of God because you do not hear. But that's exactly the opposite of what Christ says. Christ says, you do not hear because you are not of God. The Arminians confuse, they switch the premise and the conclusion. Their theology requires them to say, you are not of God because you do not hear, but Christian theology requires us to say you do not hear because you are not of God. In other words, election is the cause of regeneration, not the other way around. 
If Arminians were better logicians, they wouldn't be Arminians. <clears throat> and then let's look at another uh, passage of Scripture where Christ used what might be called an ad hominem or an apagogic argument. Um, Matthew 9, if you'll turn there, verses 10 through 13. Matthew 9, verses 10 through 13. And so it was, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, Clearly in this argument that he presents, Jesus is not saying that the Pharisees are well or righteous. He says, the sentences are, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. Then he explains, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, the Pharisees think they're well and they think they're righteous. And Jesus, for the sake of argument, accepts their premises. That this is called an, an apagogic or an ad hominem argument. He accepts their premises and he deduces from them why he eats with sinners rather than with them. Because they are well and righteous, they don't need a physician. But the sinners do, and the Pharisees are quite willing uh, to accept that the tax collectors and the sinners are not well and they are not righteous. Then there's a famous uh, example in Matthew 15 of Christ losing an argument. Uh, of course, I say that uh, tongue-in-cheek because he intended to lose it. But look at, that, look at that account there in Matthew 15 about the woman from Canaan. She comes and she says, Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, True, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is a very interesting case. Uh, what Jesus does here is he uses a figure of speech that allows this woman who is very sharp and who has great faith uh, to pick up on his figure of speech and to use it in, in an ad hominem fashion, accepting his own premise to get what she wants. He says, I was, he says to her, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She pleads, Lord, help me. He says, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. The children are the house of Israel. The dogs are the Canaanite women, the Canaanites. He's calling her a little dog. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She picks up on that. She says, true, Lord. She agrees. She accepts his premise. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And she draws out an inference from his own principle that will permit him or cause him to do what she wants. That is, to heal her daughter. And notice what Jesus' statement is. He commends the woman for her faith. Great is your faith. Great is your faith. He doesn't uh, condemn her for arguing logically. Uh, he doesn't condemn her for arguing with him. He commends her. He says, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, if this woman had been a feminist, of course, and Christ had suggested that she was a dog, uh, she would not have had her daughter healed. Uh, she would have taken great offense and stomped away. But she's smart rather than being a feminist. And she accepts his premise that she is a little dog, and she makes an inference from that um, <clears throat> that allows her daughter to be healed. 
One final example of argument in Scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. This is a great chapter on the gospel. Uh, read the passage. Now, if Christ is preached uh, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Some of the Corinthians were saying that there is no resurrection. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Now this argument is what is called in logic a sorites, that is, it is, it is an extended argument consisting of several premises and conclusions, a form of argument in which the conclusion of a prior argument becomes a premise uh, for the next argument. He, what Paul does, it's an ad hominem argument. He's trying to draw out the logical implications of the belief of some Corinthians that there is no resurrection. And the first inference he makes from that is, well, if there is no resurrection, then Christ is not risen. Obviously, if there is no res resurrection, then Christ is not risen. Um, but if that's the case, if it's the case that Christ is not risen, then our preaching is false because we preach that Christ is risen. So it follows also that our preaching is false if Christ is not risen. It follows from the premise that there is no resurrection that our preaching is false. Uh, a further consequence he draws out, your faith is futile. Your faith is futile. If our preaching is false and you have believed our, our, our false preaching, uh, then your faith is futile. If our preaching is false, to make a fourth inference, then we are false witnesses. We are false witnesses. And if your faith is futile and we are false witnesses, then you are still in your sins. You aren't saved. You're still in your sins. And those who have already died perished in their sins because they believed false, free, uh, false preaching and they believed false witnesses. So they perished in their sins. And finally, the last inference he makes is we are of all men the most pitiable in that case. If we believe false uh, preaching and are false witnesses, uh, then we're of all men the most pitiable. Now, let me conclude with some quotes from some theologians about uh, logic and reasoning. Uh, I'll begin with uh, John Wycliffe, um, the 14th century Oxford scholar. <clears throat> This is what Wycliffe wrote, all law, all philosophy, all logic, and all ethics are in Holy Scripture. In Holy Scripture is all truth. Every Christian ought to study this book uh, because it is the whole truth. Uh, another quote from Martin Luther, Scripture alone is the fount of all wisdom. Scripture alone must remain the judge and master of all books. Whoever does not consult Scripture will know nothing whatever. Nothing except the divine words are to be the first principles for Christians. All human words are conclusions drawn from them and must be brought back to them and approved by them. And let me conclude with just some quotes from some various theologians on the value of logic as well. I begin with Augustine. This is what Augustine wrote. The science of reasoning is of very great service in searching into and unraveling all sorts of questions that come up in Scripture. The validity of logical sequences is not a thing devised by men, but it is observed and noted by them that they may be able to learn and teach it, for, the, for it exists eternally in the reason of things and has its origin with God. I've quoted the Westminster Confession, chapter 1, before, but let me read it again. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. Here's a short quote from uh, George Gillespie. He was a commissioner to the uh, Westminster Assembly in the 17th century. Necessary consequences from the written word of God do sufficiently and strongly prove the consequent or conclusion, if theoretical, to be a certain divine truth which ought to be believed, 
and, if practical, to be a necessary duty, which we are obliged unto by divine law. There are other consequence or other quotes here. Let me read one from uh, James Oliver Buswell. When we accept the laws of logic, we are not accepting the laws external to God, to which he must be subject, but we are accepting laws of truth which are derived from God's holy character. If we accept the triune God as revealed in the Bible, it follows that we accept propositional truth and the laws which are inherent in the nature of propositional truth. These laws are not imposed upon our basic presupposition, but are implicit in it and received from it. The Bible is a book in human language. If we are not talking nonsense, we must then believe in the rules of linguistic expression. The Bible is a book written in human language, claims to speak the truth. If the word truth is not meaningless, it implies the laws of truth, that is, the laws of logic. A quote from uh, Gordon Clark, Logic, the law of contradiction, is not affected by sin. Even if everyone constantly violated the laws of logic, they would not be less true than if everyone constantly observed them. Or to use another example, no matter how many errors and subtraction can be found on the stubs of our checkbooks, mathematics itself is unaffected. The distinction between the psychological activity of thinking as a unique event in time and subject to the multifarious conditions of different persons and the propositions of logic or theology, which are true at all times and for all people, is a distinction that should not be difficult to make. And finally, I'll conclude with uh, some words from Benjamin Warfield, the Princeton theologian. What he says about the, the Westminster Confession and logic. He writes, It must be observed, however, that the teachings and prescriptions of Scripture are not confined by the Westminster Confession to what is expressly set down in Scripture. Men are required to believe and to obey not only what is expressly set down in Scripture, but also what by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. This is the strenuous and universal contention of Reformed theology against Socinians and Arminians, who desired to confine the authority of Scripture to its literal asseverations, its literal statements, and it involves a characteristic honoring of reason as the instrument for the ascertainment of truth. We must depend upon our human faculties to ascertain what Scripture says. We cannot suddenly abnegate them and refuse their guidance in determining what Scripture means. This is not, of course, continuing with Warfield, to make reason the ground of authority of inferred doctrines and duties. Reason is the instrument of discovery of all doctrines and duties, whether expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence deduced from Scripture. But their authority, when once discovered, is derived from God, who reveals and prescribes them in Scripture, either by literal assertion or by necessary implication. It is the reform contention reflected here in the Confession that the sense of Scripture is Scripture and that men are bound by its whole sense in all its implications. The reemergence and recent controversies of the plea that the authority of Scripture is to be confined to its expressed declarations and that human logic is not to be trusted in divine things is, therefore, a direct denial of a fundamental position of Reformed theology explicitly affirmed in the Confession, as well as an abnegation of fundamental reason, which would not only render thinking in a system impossible, but would discredit as a stroke, at a stroke, many of the fundamentals of the faith, such as the doctrine of the Trinity, and would logically involve the denial of the authority of all doctrine whatsoever, since no single doctrine of whatever simplicity can be ascertained from Scripture except by the use of the processes of the understanding. It is, therefore, an unimportant incident that the recent plea against the use of human logic in determining doctrine has been most sharply put forward in order to justify the rejection of a doctrine which is explicitly taught, and that repeatedly, in the very letter of Scripture. If the plea is valid at all, it destroys at once our confidence in all doctrines, no one of which is ascertained or formulated without the aid of human logic. So much for Warfield. Do you have a question? Um, talking about the doctrine of creation, it seems that science has greatly influenced that through Darwin especially right back in the 1800s, there's some pretty important theologians coming across from that. Uh, that's true. Um, Darwin, when he published his uh, Origin of Species and later The Descent of Man, 
um, provided what appeared to be a scientific uh, foundation for a theory that had long uh, predated him. And because uh, many theologians were impressed by science, they thought that they now had to accommodate scripture to these uh, alleged scientific discoveries. So you'll find uh, theologians trying to uh, make room for Darwinian theory by denying that the day in Genesis 1 is a literal day. It becomes millions of years, if not billions of years, and that sort of thing. And it's their, what shall I say, their um, admiration of science, an admiration that's undeserved. 